Welcome back. Our next guest is known for her outspoken journalism and her headline-worthy lifestyle. She also happens to be the wife of former media mogul Conrad Black, who spent three and a half years in prison on convictions of fraud and obstruction of justice before he was given a pardon last year. Well, she now has a tell-all memoir entitled Friends and Enemies. And in this book, Barbara Emile invites us into her lifestyle, into the world of wealth, the world of celebrity. And she also settles scores with those who perhaps fueled her high society fall from grace. She joins us today. We welcome to the show, Barbara Emile. Welcome. No, it's fabulous to be here. I must say I'm not settling scores. In my view, I'm just telling the truth. Yeah, let's talk about that, because I think for some people with a title like Friends and Enemies, um, people might assume that you are going to call out people that you you wrote it for some kind of a revenge. But you say it was not at all for that purpose. So what did propel you to write this book right now? You won't believe this. The book was designed to find out if all the horrible things that were being written about me um, were true. Because at some point, you don't know who you are. You read 200 articles on how ghastly you are. And you think, well, not everyone can be wrong. How ghastly am I? And you sit down to write what happened and see if you can find yourself. And then you find out, and this is really bad, so I don't advise you to do it. You find out that there are worse things about yourself that nobody else knew. And you find yourself <laughs> typing them out. So I do not advise you to do this because it's an exercise in masochism. <laughs> Uh, well, listen, you have such a way with words because you've had such a long and prolific career as um, a journalist, as many people know. And as a result of uh, the hundreds, thousands of things you have written, you have faced backlash um, against your critical views of things like feminism, affirmative action, uh, state policy, to name a few. I'm sure there had to be a lot of retrospectives where you were looking back at your career, perhaps things that you have written in the past. Is there anything that you look back on, revisited with with new eyes and said, oh, maybe I went too far. No, but I did change my views along the way because I don't think you're any good as a journalist unless you learn from what you're writing. For example, at one point I was against gay marriage and I thought civil unions should be good enough. And then gradually, as I began to see more and more people who had gay marriages, I thought they're doing a better job of it than heterosexuals. So I changed my view on that. If I look back on my work to be serious for a moment, I would say that most of my worst nightmares came true. Um, I said that multiculturalism was going to divide and not unite. And as I see the cancel culture now, um, and as I see the way people are, are kind of getting into groups, more in America than in Canada, because Canada is basically a more decent society than just about any I've lived in. But the li life has worked out pretty much as I suspected. Uh, you describe in the book about uh, the, the dramatic shift that you endured going from being a single journalist who, you know, was struggling to make ends meet, eating frozen dinners, to marrying Conrad Black and suddenly hosting extravagant dinner parties with guests like Princess Diana, Anna Wintour, and Margaret Thatcher, just to name a few. And you've described those evenings as terrifying. Uh, let's talk about what was going through your mind at that time as you entered into this whole new world. I adored Conrad. I didn't realize that getting into his life would mean not just attending dinner parties, which I could manage, because I had at that point in my life, I was 51, I'd given two dinner parties in my entire life, each one for four people, so six people all told. Um, and suddenly there they were, Princess Diana, prime ministers, film stars, all sorts of mega billionaires and things. It was horrible. Um, not because they were horrible. They weren't. <laughs> Princess Di particularly was a really, a really rather witty and shrewd woman, and I liked her very much. I, I remember um, when she first came to our house, she looked at the... Uh, the table plan, and she said, okay, Barbara, who's the hot guy you've put me next to? Because I had 
two fellows on each side of her, and I didn't tell her how difficult it had been to get men to sit next to her because they were all terrified. As I mentioned in the top, you know, in 2005, when your husband uh, was indicted on fraud and obstruction ch uh, charges, your life just went upside down, bouleversé, as the French would say, because your phone started getting tapped, your funds were frozen, there was all kinds of a shift in your life. Um, and I'm always curious to know, you, we know you have stood by your husband throughout all of this, but was there ever a moment when you did feel a little bit of anger or resentment that this, you know, towards your husband for all of this turmoil in your life? Good question. Um, out of the almost 14 years of really tough times, 17 years of horrible times, there was a period of 10 days when I just was ready to wring his neck. After I got <laughs> through my little snit, it, it passed because I could see, you see, I'm a journalist and I was always known for over-researching. And I couldn't even believe that my husband was innocent, although I adored him and loved him until I had researched and researched and read all the documents and read all the evidence. Once I was satisfied that he was completely innocent, then um, you, can't, you can't have any anger. You just stand by his side and you work your way through it. Barbara, you were famously quoted in a Vogue interview saying that your extravagance knows no bounds. And I know you meant this ironically, uh, but you say that you have blamed uh, Conrad's downfall in part to do with your over-the-top spending, which inclu included, uh, you know, jewelry um, to uh, $10,000 bed sheets. So really, is there, do you feel that there was a role that you played in the attention that was put on to him? I think there was. I really do. I blame myself. Conrad says no. He watched my spending carefully, and he would have said something if I went overboard. But I think that's just a husband trying to be kind. Um, I didn't care much about jewels. Uh, I never had any when I married Conrad. I mean, not a single one. I had a Cartier watch that had been given to me by one husband. Um, and it was just that all the other ladies had them, and I had this incredibly competitive streak. So I wanted to have the best linens, the best dinner parties, and I just competed with them, which was a really shallow and stupid thing to do. But I was extravagant. <laughs> I mean, I was extravagant. I gave my staff Chanel jackets. Um, I mean, it was, it was great for once to be able to give things, and I bought for myself. I, can you imagine the feeling of just walking into an Hermes store and saying, mm, I can have anything? Um, that's kind of an astonishing feeling. Uh, I, I, and, and the other thing was, because I am the way I am, I didn't miss it when it went. Um, I loved it when I had it, and then when it went and I had to sell it, I didn't miss those things. There were so many books and films um, and profiles written about you throughout your very difficult journey next to your husband. And um, throughout this process, you write about how many friends were abandoning you basically left, right, and center. So I want to ask this question. Um, what is more difficult, losing your friends or losing your reputation? I didn't have much of a reputation to lose. And I say that honestly. Conrad had the reputation to lose. The only reputation I had was of a, um, a provocateur as a, a, as a writer. So losing reputation didn't really mean much. Um, losing friends was a different thing. In England, my close girlfriends really stuck. I mean, they were staunch. Most of the English were. In Canada, they weren't. Um, Conrad's friends or the friends that I'd met through Conrad just, just disappeared. You get struck off Christmas lists. The phone stops ringing. Um, sometimes you hold out your hand to say hello to someone and they don't recognize you or pretend not to. And that's hard. That, that really is hard. I have to say that I was also responsible in one way. Um, there might have been people out there who were willing to help me. And I think there were. I think there were old friends in Canada. But I withdrew. I was a liability. If they were friends with me, they'd get called up by the press for an anecdote. And I quickly realized that I was turning my friend's life into a sort of running commentary on me and and that was not making it very easy for them. I want to jump to the end of the book which is uh, for many people perhaps the juiciest part of an already very very juicy book 
That is where you list your friends and your enemies, and you do so by country. And it mm -hmm. turns out, interestingly, that your enemy list is the longest for the country of Canada. So mm -hmm. why decide to do the friends and enemies part of the title of your book so literally in these lists? Ladies, if you have gone through 17 years of this, sort of day and night, you've seen thousands of articles written about you that are awful. You've seen lies and lies written about your husband who has nearly died in prison. And, and believe me, U.S. federal prisons are no joke. You want to get rid of all the bile that's inside you. So you, you try and list yeah. the people that really did you in and did you in because uh, not because they believed he was guilty, but because they just wanted to get at him. And you list the friends who may not have called you or asked you out, but you knew were always there. That If you picked up the phone, they would be there. And that's a terrific thing to be when somebody is in you know, essentially has been dipped in such a pile of stink. I really wish that this interview wasn't finished because this has been a fascinating journey into your fascinating life. Uh, Barbara, for your candor, I thank you so, so much for being with us today. And I thank you very much for having me. It's just been a treat. We want to remind everybody that Barbara's new tell-all memoir entitled Friends and Enemies is out and available everywhere. We'll be right back.